Hello, welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Professor Claire Rusbridge. I'm a veterinary neurologist and I have a particular interest and expertise in management of neuropathic pain. That is to say pain due to damage of the nervous system. It's sometimes also called maladaptive pain. And I'm a particular interest in finding better ways of identifying this and treating it in our pet animals. This um, YouTube video is intended to help improve our understanding of why neuropathic pain occurs and uh, specifically focusing on the neurobiology and the uh, targets that drugs have for managing this disease. It's intended for anybody who's involved in the treatment of pain in animals, um, so primarily uh, neurologists and um, pain management special specialists, uh, anesthesiologists, but also veterinary nurses, veterinary physiotherapists who are seeing a lot of pain, um, uh, painful animals, people who specialize in emotional health and behavior because pain will result in, in some cases in behavioral uh, problems and disorders. Um, and also those owners of animals with neuropathic pain disorders. So the neurobiology of pain and neuropathic pain. Well, what actually is pain? The International Association for the Study of Pain, the ISAP, defines pain as an unpleasant sensory or, uh, and emotional experience. And it's important when we're talking about domestic animals or any animal to talk about the emotional side of things because um, it's something that we humans are able to express, but animals may um, uh, have great difficulty in communicating that. It's associated with actual or potential damage or, and this is quite important, is described in terms of such damage. And again, this is a definition for humans. Animals cannot describe it. And so in terms of neuropathic pain, often the diagnosis in humans is based on that description that hu the human will give. It's burning or it's like something stabbing. It's like an electric current going down my leg. And, uh, and humans uh, can eloquently describe uh, this unpleasant sensory experience, but animals cannot. And therefore, diagnosis of neuropathic pain in animals is much more challenging. Pain is subjective. So what I find painful might not be what you find painful, or you might find that much more um, uh, painful. It really is down to the subject. And pain is very difficult to measure objectively. Again, important in our animals, because how do we tell that they are in pain? So we see three types of pain. The first is nociceptive or mechanical pain. So this is pain that arises from actual or threatened damage to non-neural tissue due to an activation of a receptor called the nociceptor. And this protects the animal for injury. So if I step on a nail, then the nociceptors in the region of my foot will identify that or signal to my um, to my brain that there has been a painful in, um, uh, input and that this is located on my foot, I will then identify the source of pain and remove it to stop my foot from getting further injury. Then we have inflammatory or uh, chemical planes, uh, pain. So this is where you have inflammation. Um, so for example, that nail has now uh, traumatized the tissue and caused inflammation, and perhaps there is infection introduced and that's also causing inflammation. And the uh, inflammatory mediators that have been released, this will also activate um, uh, that um, nociceptors and uh, result in uh, perception of pain. And then we have neuropathic or maladaptive pain. And this is pain that arises as a direct consequence um, of a lesion or diseases that are affecting essentially your nervous system, the somatosensory system. And it implies that there's abnormal processing through that either the peripheral nervous system, so that's the bit outside the spinal cord, or the central nervous system, which is the spinal cord and um, the brain. 
Um, and in humans, it's important to remember that neuropathic pain is not a diagnosis. Um, it's, a, it's a description um, and you need to establish where the lesion is. Um, but also you can't just diagnose neuropathic pain uh, on the presence of, of, of touch evoked pain um, or um, uh, uh, other signs such as a history of burning. You really have to have a more firm diagnosis than that. One thing that we need to talk about a little bit is some definitions because there can be a little bit of confusion about that, such as what is the difference between nociception and pain perception? So nociception is the process by which information about tissue damage or the potential for such damage is relayed to the brain. So you can have a, a, a nociceptive input, but not necessarily feel that it's uh, a pain full because pain is your perception. Um, so pain is your awareness of that being painful. And that's sometimes a bit, a little bit difficult concept to, um, to get over because they may not necessarily um, occur together. So the example of nociception occurring but not necessarily feeling pain is when you are faced with severe trauma um, um, or fear, then you may not feel that uh, pain. So for example, if you were being uh, chased by a lion and the lion ripped your leg off, then you may still try to get away from the lion and not feel the trauma of your head, leg being ripped off because the adrenaline would override that pain impulse. Um, and uh, you can also, uh, in the case of neuropathic pain, have perception of pain without any noxious stimuli. What this video is showing is uh, absent pain perception in a dachshund with very severe uh, intervertebral disc disease. And this is showing me pinching the toenails. And in this toenail, the, the forelimbs, the dog can feel that. We can see that he's turning round um, to look at that painful impulse. But in the back legs, um, there is absolutely no response at all. Um, this dog actually had myelomalacia. For those that are more observant can um, possibly see that uh, the dog also has breathing difficulty and Horner's syndrome. Some, some other terms Neu uh, uh, just to do with neuropathic pain and also itch. So yeah, and these are really terms that, that many vets may, may use um, uh, and uh, hopefully will know the definition of them but uh, they may use them to owners who may be listening to this video and not understand that definition. So paresthesia, this is a spontaneous or evoked abnormal sensation, but it's not unpleasant. So an example might be a sort of tingling feeling or uh, a sort of pins and needles feeling. So it's definitely abnormal um, and it will occur either spontaneously, so occurring just um, without anything uh, um, prompting it or maybe a vote so you're rough uh, just touching that area may may induce that that feeling uh, dysesthesia is very similar but it is an unpleasant uh, abnormal sensation so rather than a tingling or pins and needles is often described as being very painful and humans with this will often describe a burning sensation Allodynia is a pain from a stimulus that's not no, normally painful. So it's not normally painful if you're lightly touched, um, um, but if you, um, uh, but light touch may cause pain if the animal is sensitized, either because they already ha have an injury there um, or um, because they have neuropathic pain. And this can be also, uh, it doesn't have to be touch, it can be thermal. So you may find pain um, from having um, uh, uh, something hot or cold applied to you. Um, classically being a hot shower or a cold ice cube or possibly because of movement um, that, that, that can induce this. And anachinesis is an itch from a stimulus that's not normally itchy. So it's a similar sort of thing. So touch, light touch causing itchiness when normally uh, uh, itchiness wouldn't be induced by that. So we're going to go through some of the anatomy of, of, of nociception and pain perception. It all starts with the nociceptors. 
um, and I have a little sort of slight cartoon drawing of them. And these nociceptors are, are, are present in high quantities in the skin, high quantities in the periosteum, uh, which is the covering of the, of the bones, the joints, the tendons and the muscle, and some of them also in the surface viscera, so in the lining of the gut, the, the, the liver, etc. So the most uh, first uh, fibre we're going to talk about is the uh, alpha delta fibres um, and these are specialised either for thermal, um, so detecting noxious thermal information, or mechanical, so injurious mechanical information. And these uh, travel at high speed, so between uh, 5 and 30 metres per second, depending on the different fibres. So um, uh, our, our most fast conducting fibres are, um, are our motor nerves, which are travelling at, at at least 60 metres per second. Uh, and also our sensory touch fibres, which are travelling up to 70 metres per second. Um, but these are traveling very fast and that's obviously very important because we need to, to have information about pain uh, in something that's going to cause injury um, so noxious meaning something that causes injury obviously injurious as well we need to have that information pretty quickly we don't want it to be dilly-dallying about um, and so um, these are uh, p fibers that have quite a small surface area um, also important so that you can rapidly distinguish where that noxious injury is coming from. So if it was a pin, for example, you would be able to, pardon the pun, pinpoint it uh, really accurately um, based on these, um, these uh, fibres which have a very small surface area. Um, then we have the C fibres. Um, and these are activated when there is high intensity mechanical, chemical or thermal, both hot and cold stimuli. So they're doing pain, temperature and also the specialised ones doing itch. Uh, it takes a lot to activate them, but once they're um, activated, they stay activated for some time uh, and they cover a large area. Um, and so um, their distribution is much larger than these. And so uh, it's much more difficult to pinpoint where the pain is coming from when you have activation of the C fibres. And they travel very slowly. And this is partly because they are unmyelinated, whereas the other fibres have myelin, this insulation. So what happens when you have an injury? So here we have a hammer hitting a thumb. And the first thing that happens is that you have those alpha delta fibers and you experience a fast, sharp pain. So it occurs quickly. It's a sharp pain. You know where it is. And this is actually the afferent arm of the withdrawal reflex. So um, what would happen is that you would take away your um, your thumb in response to that injury. It's a reflex. Um, in animals, we pinch their toes. We expect to see the limb withdraw. That is a reflex. It's nothing to do with pain perception. It, it is, um, although it's one of the arms that will eventually go up to pain perception, just because there is a withdrawal reflex there doesn't mean the animal has uh, has felt that pain uh, because that requires transmission through the spinal cord going up to the brain. So um, this is very important for escape and survival. So to know that you're being injured and get away from it or withdraw that arm. Then after a more sustained injury, those C fibres are activated and this gives you a slower, dull ache. It's less precisely located because the no nociceptors are more broadly distributed. And that, uh, that activation by those C fibres is what ultimately goes into your memory. And that's important for learning avoidance. So this one protects you in the acute in instance for your survival and getting away. But this one goes to your memory. And that's uh, obviously very important for our, um, well, for all animals, um, but with uh, dogs and cats, for example, when they're injured, they will um, remember that context, which can have important bearing um, on learning. So the animal, for example, if they're hurt in a veterinary practice, may, um, will be likely to remember that hurt and try to avoid it in the future, because that is also important for their survival. Uh, and also this can affect um, uh, the animal's behavioural response more long term. This is also important for peripheral 
hypersensitivity. So in the first instance, you have this primary area of hyperalgesia, um, for example, associated with a disc extrusion. But when the C-fibers are activated, you get a secondary area that's beyond the injury. So if I was to touch here, the animal would also react even though the primary injury is here. So these are our nociceptors and where do they go to? Well, they go to an area of the spinal cord called the dorsal horn. Um, and so they come in through the uh, peripheral nerve and the uh, cell body for that peripheral nerve is in something called the dorsal nerve root ganglion that enters uh, the nerve root area and in particular the superficial layer of the dorsal horn receives those pain and itch impulses and then they're transmitted and modified through further um, layers and then that information is transmitted up um, to uh, the uh, central areas of the brain. Uh, in the human, uh, uh, a lot of those fibres will decussate and go up the spinothalamic tract. Um, however, there are many different tracts that transmit uh, pain information. In carnivores, uh, the most important tract is the spinocervical thalamic tract, which also relays through the, um, uh, the lateral cervical nucleus here. And we also have um, descending fibres, which we're going to talk about uh, in uh, later part of this talk, uh, coming down from the brain stem. And these will also modify how that, um, that pain is perceived. So what actually happens at the level of the superficial um, dorsal horn? Well, first of all, we have these alpha delta fibers coming in and we have the C fibers coming in. And they release the neurotransmitter uh, excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. And that's going to come back um, uh, in uh, a later slide because glutamate is a target for many uh, drugs which affect pain. In particular, it is the target for the gabapentinoid drugs. So rather ironically, perhaps, uh, the gabapentinoid drugs do not affect GABA. The gabapentinoid drugs affect uh, glutamate. Um, we also get released of uh, a substance called substance P, um, where the P stands for pain from uh, the C fibers. And this substance P is very important for wind up of, of pain. So if the painful impulse is sustained, um, so after that we get an action potential and it, that is transmitted. But if it is sustained, then eventually magnesium is lifted off a receptor called the NMDA receptor. And that NMDA receptor is also very important um, with the chronification and amplification of pain. And drugs like ketamine and amantadine block this receptor. Um, uh, and you can see how useful that would be in preventing uh, wind up of that pain. And then what happens is you get to quite a few changes in this uh, postsynaptic membrane. You get a lot more receptors uh, readily available. And that results in release of nitric oxide, which affects the presynaptic fibres, and they're much more likely, therefore, to release their neurotransmitter. So we get a state of synaptic hyperexcitability. Uh, and this uh, uh, is a very simple way, it's a bit more complicated than that, a uh, very simple way of explaining wind up, um, which is where you have a central uh, sensitization. So basically, the more pain you have, the more that pain amplifies through that process. And you can think about it as, you know, you start off maybe with a headache, it's a little bit of a niggle. Have you really got pain? Yeah, yes, it does. But as time goes on, it gets worse and worse and worse. Um, and uh, especially when you start getting anxious about it as well. So that pain um, uh, becomes more uh, uh, intense. And this is also important from a, um, a management point of view, because if you can get in there before all of these receptors are activated and all of these synaptic hyperexcitability uh, has occurred, you will have to use less drugs than you will once there is a wind up. Uh, because when you when there's already a wind up, you will have to use an awful lot more drugs to block all of these receptors. So that is why it's very important in pain management to be preemptive with pain. So you'll find um, uh, if your animal is coming in for uh, a, um, a procedure, then the anesthesiologist uh, and the vet will want to give 
a drug to block pain before they have a surgical procedure, not just after the procedure. So what sort of drugs can we use? Um, so basically when we're treating neuropathic pain, it should be said that there are very few drugs that are actually specific for treating neuropathic pain. Most of these drugs are what we call adjuvant drugs, which means they started out life uh, being used for something else. And they also happen to have a rather broad spectrum activity, which means that they can also be useful for treating neuropathic pain. And that also means that a lot of these drugs have side effects um, that affect other systems because these are broad, um, uh, broad drugs. Um, and, uh, and that will also limit how much you can give them and sometimes where you can uh, uh, give them. So first of all, at the level of the excitatory neuron, we can block the sodium channel, which is important for release of that glutamate. So examples of sodium channel block blockers are local anesthetics, lidocaine. Um, uh, it also is some of the drugs used for treating depression, such as uh, amitriptyline, and also some of the anti-epileptic drugs, such as phenytoin, cabazimapine, and oxcabazimapine. Cabazimapine and oxcabazimapine are, uh, are used in, uh, for uh, human management of trigeminal neuralgia, but uh, phenytoin, cabazimapine and oxcabazimapine are not effective for the dog uh, because they have a very, very short half-life. There may be some um, core in some instances to use cabazimapine for treating neuropathic pain in cats. Um, but we tend to use other drugs uh, in preference. We can cause inhibition of release of the glutamate. So this is where gabapentin and pregabalin, the, the gabapentinoid drugs, uh, are, uh, have their main site of action. Also phenobarbital has an action here. So in some instances we can use phenobarbital to treat pain, although it has um, uh, it, this anti-epileptic drug has much more adverse effects than um, some of the other drugs that we have an option for. And so it's only usually used in very specific circumstances. For example, it does seem that some pain syndromes such as feline oral facial pain syndrome seems to respond better to phenobarbital than it does to some of the other uh, 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 more usual drugs. Then we can have drugs that uh, affect the GABA receptor. So these are things like the benzodiazepine, such as Valium and some of the barbiturate drugs. And then we can have drugs that affect the NMDA receptor, such as ketamine, uh, amantadine and amantine um, uh, are all affecting that receptor. So the take home message is there are a lot of drugs that we use for treating neuropathic pain, but none of them are actually specific for it. Um, and they are, are, are usually anti-epileptic drugs. Um, drugs um, such as lidocaine can also affect the cardiovascular system. So they have that kind of um, uh, side effect. Um, uh, ketamine is uh, um, an injectable drug that's normally used for, as an anesthetic. Um, these drugs, uh, the benzodiazepine and the barbiturates, are normally used as anaesthetics or sedatives. So all of these drugs have many other primary uses. We, the subject is on neuropathic pain, um, and uh, generally neuropathic pain is the most common wor uh, word of describing this syndrome. I've said before about maladaptive pain. In many ways, that's uh, preferred because when we're talking about neuropathic pain, we're really talking about neurons the whole time. But actually, in the nervous system, there's a lot of other cells that are very important. And actually, um, uh, those tend to get ignored when we're doing treatment um, and just even thinking about pathophysiology. And so there are, are very importantly, there are also the glial cells, which are the microglia and the astrocytes and inflammatory cells such as mast cells and T cells. And these have incredible importance in the pathogenesis and the maintenance of neuropathic pain. And it's um, uh, really quite surprising that there are so few treatments that are used to direct against this non-neuronal neuropathic pain, especially since those elements are so important 
in um, in maintenance of that neuro of that pain, uh, and that's why many people think of it as a hexapartite uh, synapse with these interconnected cellular elements all having influence on each other. So really, when you're trying to manage neuropathic pain, it's not really a surprise that just giving one drug, you know, just give gabapentin, as some people might think is ineffective. And the way I think about it is, if, is that when you're treating neuropathic pain, you're, it's like you're trying to stop sheep escaping from a field. Yeah, you can shut the gate. Yep, um, that's your gabapentin. But if you haven't shored up the walls and repaired the hedges, those sheep are still going to escape. Um, so really, how can we expect to treat neuropathic pain with one single drug that just affects one part of the synapse in the neurons only. And so we really start should start to think about drugs that affect neuroinflammation, toll receptor, um, uh, light receptor four, and the cabinoid receptors. And this is where things like uh, uh, drugs that affect those cabinoid receptors, such as cabinoid oil, um, uh, CBD oil, uh, might have some use. Um, uh, we also have uh, a substance uh, called PEA. Uh, I'm not going to try and say uh, the, uh, the, the proper name out loud because I feel I might embarrass myself. And there's also some roles for drugs that might reduce uh, neuroinflammation, such as minocycline and propentophylline. However, the evidence for those is, is quite poor. And so there is some uh, interest in looking at drugs uh, and supplements that might affect uh, these non-neuronal elements. There's also a, a, a lot of interest in drugs that are uh, that are specific for neuropathic pain or, or, or at least the mechanism um, of neuropathic pain from osteoarthritis. Uh, and these are the monoclonal antibodies targeting the, uh, the um, nerve growth factor. Uh, and these are specifically drugs like uh, Labrella and Silencia. So what happens when well, we have chronic pain, for example, osteoarthritis, and this will in increase the nerve growth factor, which uh, binds to something called tyrosine kinase on the no nociceptor. And that travels to the dorsal nerve root ganglion, where it uh, interferes with uh, the uh, tyrosine uh, sorry, interferes with uh, the genetic uh, processing um, uh, in the dorsal nerve root um, uh, dorsal nerve root ganglion, and results basically in an upregulation of that dorsal nerve root uh, ganglion, an overexpression of substance P and uh, calcitonin gene-related peptide, which is another neurotransmitter of pain, and that leads to central and peripheral sensitization. And what the monoclonal uh, antibody targeting nerve growth factor does is it, it, is, is it basically very specifically targets that mechanism and will reduce that overexpression. And so there's a lot of interest in these sort of very highly specific drugs, um, which are given by injection once monthly for reducing that wind up that you get with chronic pain such as osteoarthritis. Other ways in which you can affect uh, uh, pain is by the descending control that comes down from the brain, from, specifically from brainstem uh, uh, neurons, um, such as uh, serotonin that is coming down from the nucleus raf magnus in the brainstem, uh, noradrenaline, uh, which uh, has a centre in the locus ceruleus and the medulla. Uh, so, for example, drugs that affect noradrenaline are uh, drugs like dexmedetomidine um, or dexdomator, as it's marketed. Um, which is a sedative, but it's, uh, I find it an extremely useful sedative for reducing um, pain during surgical procedures. Serotonin, we have uh, various drugs which will affect serotonin, such as the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Actually, fairly disappointing in how effective they are for pain relief in animals, but there are some specific drugs which are, are, are used now in humans. Uh, and of course, this is uh, another very important descending controllers from the opioids, um, either the natural uh, opioids, such as the endorphins, uh, and also um, uh, substances which we give to reduce pain, such as uh, methadone and morphine. And these are, uh, uh, have um, a site uh, 
of action actually widespread in the nervous system but particularly in the periaqueductal gray matter in the brain stem and the dorsal horn so these are all potential drug uh, action sites in um, which will um, be important for managing pain however one other concept i'd like to th you to think about is is the brain uh, and pain perception so how you um, uh, uh, perceive pain is down to a very complex circuitry in the uh, cortex so-called cortical limbic circuitry which some people refer to as the pain matrix um, and uh, you know the, the, this is a very very complex um, set of circuits through very widespread areas uh, some of the most important are the amygdala um, so it's very important for uh, consolidating the emotional memory of events. So uh, when you uh, uh, have an animal that has an injury, um, that it's, um, uh, this will be encoded in their memory and that memory will become extremely strong. Uh, to give you a, an example, um, I had a, a dog once that was uh, investigating some horses in a field and she touched her nose on the, uh, through, the, through the fence, she touched her nose on the electric um, cable uh, that was being used to keep those horses from uh, leaning against their nice wooden fence. Um, this obviously caused her, this gave her electric shock, caused her a great deal of pain. Um, she um, screamed the place down, as you might expect. It was a fairly short-lived pain. But years later, we visited the same place and there was no horses. Um, there was no fence left. And she crawled on her belly round the entire perimeter of that at that field it had obviously evoked such a strong memory in that dog of that uh, of that painful impulse so remember pain is a protective um, uh, it, it is something that we perceive to protect ourselves from injury you also need to translate that if an animal has a painful event that occurs in say a veterinary practice then they are going to remember that. And that is why uh, the animal, no matter how many positive events, if something really uh, uh, frightening occurs, they're much more likely to remember that than they are the very positive effect, uh, events, especially if they have perhaps more a negative outlook. A hippocampus uh, will convert that short-term memory to a long-term memory event. Um, and they will also regulate fear by activating that uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal uh, access. So they'll cause uh, adrenaline and, um, to be released. And also adrenaline will affect that, the, uh, that encoding of that memory and make it much stronger. And then we have the prefrontal cortex and the cranial uh, cingulate gyrus. And that receives all that, the, the visual, auditory and emotive inputs. And that's involved in your planning of your complex cognitive behavior, your personality, your expression, your decision making and moderating your uh, social behavior. So if you have a painful event and a painful memory, that will be transmitted to how you behave. Um, um, so uh, take home points, it's connected to that hypothalamic uh, pituitary adrenal access. So fear will, um, uh, will influence it and it will influence um, your fear. Um, so this will affect your decision making, your emotional regulation and your memory. So it is, uh, this circuitry is your modulator for your acute pain, but it's actually critical for the chronification of pain. So when you have chronic pain, you have changes in that circuitry. Um, not so your chronic, chronic osteoarthritis is not just affecting your joints, not just affecting your dorsal nerve root ganglion, not just affecting your overexpression of substance P in the spinal cord, but this is affecting your um, cortical limbic circuitry and all of your planning um, for your cognitive behavioral um, dis, um, uh, uh, behavior, your personality and your memory. Now, uh, those of you who uh, suffer from uh, a painful disease will know how it affects your memory. 
you know, when you've got a headache, you can't concentrate on anything, can you? It's very difficult to study. It's very difficult to learn things um, because that pain takes away from all of those resources. So we have to bear in mind that that is also happening in animals. And we also have to bear in mind that there is a functional overlap between this circuitry, which is involved in our behaviour, and in our pain regulation. And this is why chronic stress can worsen pain and that vice versa can occur as well. So chronic pain can result in, uh, uh, in uh, mental health disorders such as anxiety um, and uh, behavioral disorders in dogs. So it all is very complex. When we're talking about the pain matrix, we can make simplify it by thinking of it as in three different contexts. So first of all, we have a sensory discriminative dimension. So this uh, gives us the localization and the severity of pain. So I come and stamp on this tack. Um, I, I know that it hurts in the heel of my foot. Um, I know how much it hurts. Um, how severe it is um, and where it is. Then we have an effective or a motivational whip. So this is the emotional response to pain. The pain hurts. I'm upset by this. Um, I may be angry by this. Who, who left this tack here? Um, why is my foot injured? This is, this is not acceptable. And then I have a cognitive dimension. A pain demands that I make a behavioural response to this. It demands that I do something to protect my foot. So and in the, under normal circumstances, I would inspect my foot. I would see that there's a nail there. I would think this nail is very dangerous. Who left this here? I will remove this nail and I'll stop other people having uh, this injury. But imagine if you can't do anything about it. For imagine for if you have chronic osteoarthritis, for example, and pain is demanding that behavioural response, but there is no behavioural response that you can necessarily do to protect yourself from pain, except, for example, um, uh, avoidance of doing certain activities. And that chronic, uh, do something about it, do something about it, do something about it, is what uh, is going on in their brains and can predispose um, them to uh, to other behavioural disorders or in humans mental health disorders because pain affects all of those other cortical processes and predisposes those stress related behavioural disorders. So this in a nutshell is a neurobiology of, uh, of pain and just uh, as a little summary we have a noxious stimulus that comes in that affects the nociceptor that goes into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. It's uh, eventually transmitted up to the thala thalamus through the various tracts in the spinal cord. And then it goes to the pain matrix. It's very, very complicated circuitry. This gives us a cognitive appraisal, an emotional reaction, a behavioral response and diverts the animal's attention. And we also have this descending control of pain coming down um, uh, from the pain matrix and also more importantly these brainstem uh, um, centres was also affect how you perceive that pain. Our take home message is that pain is complex. It demands a behavioural response and it influences and is influenced by your me uh, mental state. If you're managing pain, and this is what we're going to talk in future uh, uh, lectures, then you really need a multimodal approach, as well as being uh, uh, as considering the neuroanatomy um, and uh, and whatever's causing the pain, so uh, osteoarthritis or uh, visceral pain or skin pain. We also have to consider the emotional health of the animal. Uh, and, and contributory factors from the environment and, and social psychosocial factors uh, because of the fact that this is influences and is influenced by the mental state. So if you can, uh, if an animal has very poor emotional capacity, they're also going to be less able to deal with pain, but pain will also affect their emotional capacity. You need to consider polypharmacy, so multiple drugs, 
stopped at those sheep escaping through the gate and also through the hedges and the over the stone walls. Um, and also and drugs aren't enough uh, and it's we uh, often neglect um, uh, considering physical therapy. So what's physical therapy? It may mean gentle exercise, it may mean walking, it may mean hydrotherapy, um, it may mean um, uh, massage or movement of those joints. And we should also consider physiotherapy and other complementary therapy. And I'm going to stop this, uh, this YouTube video uh, now. In the future, we're going to talk about the different pain syndromes and what their treatment is going to be. So that was a very quick whiz through the very complicated subject of the neurobiology of pain and neuropathic pain. And we were focusing on uh, the areas that we could have drug targets for treatment of those disorders. In subsequent lectures, we're going to talk about some of the neuropathic pain disorders, such as Chiari malformation and syringomyelia, feline oral facial pain syndrome, feline hyperesthesia syndrome, and also uh, neuropathic pain after injury, uh, for example, uh, following trauma or surgery. And until then, goodbye.